The Eagles defense is struggling, and while well, sure, the players obviously aren't making plays, but the film breakdown shows some serious flaws in Vic Fangio's scheme early on this season. Plus, Darius Slay throws his teammate under the bus, creating some brand new drama in the Birds' secondary, and Jalen Hurts is not playing well, but is it all the quarterback's fault? I'm Thomas Mott, this is The Thomas Mott Show. <laughs> There's nothing worse than watching your team get absolutely embarrassed on Sunday and then watching some of your players act like it's not even that big of a deal, which is now honestly the latest controversy sweeping the Birds defense today as Darius Slay and it only got worked by the Bucks receivers in Tampa. Also, he's giving up the third highest passer rating allowed in the entire NFL just four weeks in. But then after the game, started out by throwing out his career stats on Twitter, which was odd, then retweeted a film breakdown of Eagle receivers getting cooked by a Bucks DB. And worst of all now, he went on Micah Parsons' podcast just hours after the Tampa loss and made fun of his teammate, Cedric Gunner Johnson. <laughs> Man, you know, hey, you go talk, you got to back it up at some point in time. And if you don't, he know for sure that media go catch it, go catch it on attention, and he got to be ready to answer every time. Because if he don't, <laughs> they, media go move ass every time. But every you know time. what's up with you know what's up with him? He gonna do it. Now, hey, I told him do your thing, man. But hey, you know now you don't perform the way you want to perform. They gonna get back on you. I personally cannot stand athletes having their own podcast. Not because they shouldn't be allowed to have their own podcast, but it's just a terrible look whenever you just got cooked, you just got destroyed by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then you go on a podcast, you joke around, and act like it's not a big deal. To fans, it's an absolutely massive deal. Oh, and before you go saying Thomas, he's just joking around. No one really cares. I'm sure he's serious. Well, he was making fun of Garner Johnson, who then posted this to his IG story just a couple of hours ago. I think former Eagle Trey Thomas said it best when he tweeted, Man, I couldn't imagine Bobby Taylor, Troy Vincent, Lito Shepard, Sheldon Brown, or Al Harris going on DeMarcus Ware's MySpace Live show to discuss B-Doc's performance. The Birds culture right now, it just continues to seem a little bit too soft, right? You have this cycle of arguing with fans on Twitter, and then looking unprepared for games, and then getting cooked in those games, and then losing those games, and then repeating the cycle on and on again, really dating back to last year. How about this for just a new rule in general? If you look bad and lose on Sunday, be more like Saquon Barkley, who declined to go on a scheduled interview to promote a sponsorship deal where he would make extra money the day following his drop versus the Falcons because he didn't feel like it was the right move. Again, this could be no deal, it could be a medium deal, it could be a big deal. I don't like the look, but I'm curious where you guys are at on it down below in the comment section. Oh, and in case you missed it, I'm giving away this Hurts Barkley t-shirt on yesterday's show. Got a comment on that one. Link down below to get to that video. Video, check it out right now. Now, staying with the bad defensive news, how about this for a twist on the Hassan Reddick situation? After weeks of rumors, we're saying, oh, Reddick is about to be moved, the Jets are going to trade him, and then last week it was, oh, Reddick actually has said he wants to be an Eagle. Well, apparently that was all for nothing, as Ian Rappaport confirmed just yesterday, quote, the Jets situation with Hassan Reddick still has no resolution, and some wondered if the Jets could trade him back to the Eagles. Turns out, per NFL rules, not possible. Teams can't trade back a player, then reacquire him via trade until two years elapse. Reddick won't be headed back to Philadelphia. And I'm just wondering, why didn't anyone say this, right? Like, the media in Philadelphia has been talking about Reddick back to Philly, Reddick back to Philly, and that never was really a possibility, apparently, because you can't trade back for a player until two years have elapsed. I guess the only real way you could acquire Hassan Reddick is if the Jets actually cut him, which doesn't seem like a real possibility because of what they gave up to acquire him. Either way, I guess the pass rush isn't getting help from a familiar face anytime soon. And trust me, the pass rush does need help, as Jordan Davis and Bryce Huff, well, they won 0% of their pass rush attempts versus the Bucks this past Sunday, leading Vic Fangio just a couple of minutes ago to say he does think Bryce Huff is improving, which I guess should make us feel somewhat better. Yeah, I think he's improving. You know, when I say improving... You know, against the run, you know, that's something that he hadn't really been asked to do in, in his past, and that's been an adjustment for him. I'm seeing some improvement there. We don't ask him to drop very often, you know, but when he does, I, I'm seeing some improvement there. So he's working hard at it. Uh, he's as frustrated with it as any of us are, but uh, confident he'll get it going. I've raved about Vic Fangio all offseason long. I thought he was going to be a doll in the room. His scheme was going to work out. And yet, as you look at the film, his scheme and decision-making, it's kind of been less than subpar. I mean, starting with the Devin White playing all of training camp as the one and then not playing at all, being just let alone very confusing. But how about Philadelphia's corners having not pressed in 88% of snaps this season, the worst press rate by far in the NFL? 
When asked about it today, Fangio basically said they need to press more. They came out throwing, obviously, and throwing quick, um, and we weren't close enough. We, we played a lot more man in those first three series than we usually do, and or we were in uh, some tight matchup zones, and we just didn't play it good enough. They act, their pass offense was better than our pass defense. Well, they came out throwing real fast, real quick, and we weren't tight enough. And we fell behind the, uh, the chains because of that. Um, and it just kind of snowballed. We never got, couldn't make the play to get them the second and 10 or third and 10. And it just never happened. Plus, when you watch a breakdown like Brian Baldinger did on Bryce Huff's film from a year ago when he was a double-digit sack player in New York versus where it is right now, you start to kind of wonder, is it all Huff's fault or is the Fangio scheme not a good fit? Last year, Bryce Huff had 10 sacks for the Jets. This is how he rushed. In a four-point stance, he's a sprinter. His nickname is the Bugatti. He has a great takeoff. That's what he does. That's how the Jets played him. In a four-point stance with great takeoff. Now, you watch him here. Now he's a linebacker. Now he's in a two-point stance, standing up. He hasn't beaten anybody. He's playing linebacker. He's trying to see too much right here. And backup tackles like Justin School can block him. All right? This is not how Bryce Huff got 10 sacks. You watch him, and here he is against Miami. Four-point stance. Almost, I think all 10 of his sacks last year came out of this look right here. Cross chop. Beats the tackle. Sprinter. Gets the Tua. Down goes Tua. You watch him on Sunday, and here he is. He is over here against a great player in Tristan Wirfs. Like two-point stance, no takeoff, and he's just getting controlled. Play after play after play. He's got no stats, nothing. But here, in a four-point stance, the way he's used to playing in pass rush situation, right here. Man, change of direction, the whole thing. This isn't how he... This isn't who he is. You watch him right now against Tampa. Like, he's going up against a backup tackle. He can't beat him. He doesn't have a takeoff. He's in a two-point stance. They're dropping him into coverage. He's, he's on the ground. That's not good. You can't put, win on the ground. You watch him against a back uh, against a tight end right here. Two-point stance. Like, this is not, like, he's getting beat by a tight end. You want to get the best out of Bryce Huff, put him in a four-point stance. Let him do nothing but chase the quarterback. Now, I'll say it again because I'm going to read the comments where it's like, Thomas, you're not a film expert. I know I'm not a film expert. That's why I give you the Brian Baldinger clip because he is a film expert. But what I do know is the Eagle defense has been a problem. It's not gotten much better. And there's got to be some changes or else you're going to keep seeing teams like the Bucks shred the birds week after week. Now, one simple solution seems to be playing Cooper DeGene instead of Avante Maddox in the slot, who has only been the Eagles' worst cover corner really the entire year, but missed some really bad tackles on Sunday versus the Bucks. Fangio, I think to his credit, did seem to agree, and I think you can make the assumption he's hinting here that is probably going to be the starting nickel when they get back after the bye. Anywhere we just, at some point, we'll put him out there. Um, but Avante, you know, has played fine in some areas. Obviously, he's had some plays that he'd like to have back, like all of us, including me. But, um, yeah, he's getting better. Now, if you want me to be positive, how about this? Quinion Mitchell, he was very impressive versus the Bucks. continues his incredible rookie season. Two catches on four targets allowed for just 19 yards and was also the only player on defense to play all 77 snaps in that 105-degree weather. Oh, and a little bonus here. It sounds like Sidney Brown is going to start practicing after the bye week, which, again, more bodies in the secondary is always good news. Now, going over to the offense, I know there's been a lot made in the past 48 hours about Jalen Hurts' play versus the Bucks and his turnover struggles through the first four games. And I have zero interest in defending Hurts for his turnovers. Like, eight through four games is indefensible. And honestly, it's not a stretch to say he looks way worse just overall as a quarterback than he did two years ago during that magical run in 2022. But to be fair, and might I say defend Hurts a little bit here, we've only seen the offense at full strength for one game. And that was week one versus the Packers, where the offense scored 34 points, Jalen had 300 total yards, and had some really great throws, of course, mixed in with some not great throws. The Falcons game, I thought, was a pretty good day for Hurts. I'd blame the play calling more than anything for the debacle there. And then the Saints game was an injury-filled mess that Hurts still eventually found a way to win. Playing against Todd Bowles in Tampa without your top two receivers and you're missing your starting right tackle, we all knew it wasn't going to be a 400-yard, four-touchdown day, and yet we're all kind of still complaining that it wasn't. 
Now, again, he's not been perfect. He's been below average. I'm not saying Jalen Hurts has been a top 15 quarterback by any stretch of the word, but being pressured 14 times and enduring four sacks would make any quarterback struggle, as Brian Baldinger pointed out in his film breakdown of the Bucks' blitz packages this past Sunday. On third and 10, the Bucks put six up on the defensive line, all right? The Eagles have five blockers, so they think they're going to be slick here. Jalen Hurts is going to change the protection to a roll protection, all right? Just a roll right here. And they do take care of all the dangerous players right here, all right, on this roll. Except they don't have an answer for the rookie, Tyke Smith, right here. He comes free and puts the wood right there on Jalen Hurts, all right? They've gained seven yards. Now, Levante right here, Levante David, he's going to pick the right tackle, Fred Johnson, all right? He's going for the pick, and here comes the twist off of it. And they put a hit right there on Jalen Hurts, and he sails the ball over the receiver's head, all right? They hit him every kind of way that you can. This is only a four-man rush, right? It looks like there's a whole bunch up there, but only four are coming. Let's watch Levante here. Like, Diaby is going to come as a free hitter, all right? He's coming free. Now, watch what they do. They destroyed their protections all day. Here they come. Free hitter right here. Diaby coming right at Jalen Hurts, all right? They're only, you watch right here, Jurgens and Dickerson are guarding grass. They're breaking down the protections all day, and right there, Jalen sails the ball. Okay, here we go. Biggest play of the game, all right? It's uh, first and 10 at the 19-yard line. They're only going to rush four. But here you go. Levante David's coming back on backer, right? Saquon on Levante. Here he comes. Now, Jalen tries to sidestep him right here. And here he comes. Bam. Gets the ball out of his hands, all right? Fumbled, recovered by Tampa. And if you watch the play right here, I mean, Jalen's trying to buy some time because he's got a divide play right here. They're going to split right here at Calcaterra. This is right where he wants to go. Right, that's, He's looking. He's ready to cock it and throw it. Ball's out. All right. All day long. You watch this right here. Like, this is a hell of a block by Gainwell. Best block by running back all year. Bam. All right. But Jalen under siege. Well, Avante David, two sacks on the day. They blitzed. On just a five-man rush right here. You watch this. Another fumble right here. Here they come. Five-man rush. And here they come. And they get right there. Diaby gets to him. Gets the ball out. Fred Johnson recovers. They blitz on the final play of the game. Fourth and 11. Final play of the game they came after. The only six-man pressure all day. Like, you look right here. The tight end and back are doing, like, they're just in protection, but they're not blocking anybody. Here they come. The Eagles... Pass protections were beaten by Todd Bowles again, like he did in the playoffs and like he did on Sunday down in Tampa. Vita Vea got a big smile on his face right there with the day that he had. And again, I'm not pretending like Jalen is playing like a top 10 quarterback, but I think there are some out of his control circumstances that have been definitely an issue. He hasn't played great. Yes, I'm worried, but not everything is the quarterback's fault 100%. As Shane Huff, I think, very well emphasized on Twitter just a couple of days ago, saying, quote, There has been far too much made of Jalen Hurts struggling yesterday, down A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Lane Johnson. Just look around the league. Aaron Rodgers took five sacks and was only 24-42 passing and lost a game when his defense allowed just 186 yards. Justin Herbert was down both OTs, and after an opening drive touchdown, only gained 20 yards and two first downs on their next six possessions and ended the game with 179 passing yards. Josh Allen was down 21-3 quickly. He was pressured on 44% of his dropbacks. He had a fumble lost and was 16 for 29 for a buck 80 in a 35-10 loss. Hertz was pressured on 57% of his dropbacks. It was not pretty. But look around the league for some context and then remember that as bad as it was, the Eagles offense ranks 11th in DVOA right now with A.J. Brown missing three or four games. And that right there sums up where I'm at with the Philadelphia Eagles, right? This offense can be really good. We've seen it when they're at full strength. They're going to be at full strength versus the Browns, and I think they're going to score 30-plus points against the Browns defense that is good, but obviously struggling and not great. It's the Bird defense that has me concerned, right? It's Darius Slay running his mouth on a podcast. It's Gardner Johnson being upset by it. It's, you know, the linebackers missing 14 tackles. It's the pass rush not getting home. It's Fangio not pressing when he knows the opposing offense is going to, you know, throw a lot of quick passes and the birds can't stop it. That is where my concern lies. And if the Eagles don't fix this defense and it's a bottom third of the league defense going forward and rest of 2024, they're going to be a mediocre football team. The offense can only do so much. And of course, Hurts' turnovers are a problem as well. It's a whole separate issue. But I think overall, the offense is going to be just fine. And I think you guys would agree, but I'm curious where you guys are at on that. 
Plenty more stuff happening, even though it's the bye week. We're keeping an eye on for any sort of changes that are going to happen. Go ahead and subscribe to the notification bell. I'm Thomas Mott. This has been the Thomas Mott Show. Back, 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 back.